kneel before Zor. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war Hang on! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Just a Gigolo, released May 1st, 1981. It was written by Julius Brammer, Irving Caesar, Ennio De Concini, and Joshua Sinclair, based on a story by Ted Rose, directed by David Hemmings, and released by United Artists Classics. In 1924, Julius Brammer wrote the lyrics of what would become the song Just a Gigolo. Four years later, Leonello Casucci composed music for what was called, at the time, Schoner Gigolo, Armor Gigolo. A year later, Irving Caesar adapted the song into English from its native Austrian. But the best-known version of the song was a 1956 version recorded by Louis Prima and paired with I Ain't Got Nobody. Do you guys recall when we last heard Prima's I Ain't Got Nobody for the podcast? I didn't think he would. It's on the jukebox in Jake LaMotta's club when he's hitting on a trio of child women. Jake LaMotta is from Raging, uh, Raging Bull. Raging Bull, yes. Okay. The same Prima version was also all over the Nobody trailer. That's the new Bob Odenkirk movie. Yeah. I, 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 I ain't got nobody. The song was later famously covered by the Village People for this film's soundtrack and later still by David Lee Roth. Bowie only did this as a favor to Hemmings. Sorry, just a gigolo was covered. Correct. Not I Ain't Got Nobody. Well, the songs have sort of been eternally combined. Oh. Because Prima did, he performed both songs, and there's a very popular remix of his two versions of the song, and so... So that's the one, I haven't listened to the David Lee Roth one or... Yeah, and the David Lee Roth is a combination of both songs. Yeah, and a lot of the IMDb credits for... The one song are actually credits to the slash both both versions of the song together. Got it. Bowie says he only did this film as a favor to Hemmings in exchange for the producing of a documentary of his 1978 concert tour and because, quote, Marlena Dietrich was dangled in front of me, end quote. Like he was like, oh, I get to make a movie with her? Okay, then yeah, let's do it. Sadly, Bowie and Dietrich never actually met, shooting their only scenes together in separate countries. Dietrich is the only member of the cast from Berlin, where the film was shot and took place, but refused to appear in the city after a self-imposed exile, instead shooting her scenes in Paris. We open on a snow-covered World War I battlefield in Sepiatone, and the opening titles Marlena Dietrich's card reads, With Great Pride. A Prussian officer we will come to know as Paul, played by David Bowie, marches along as explosions erupt behind him. Oh, damn. Their marching is done to the sound of what sounds like rubber shoes on linoleum. Yeah, it's very <laughs> weird foley. Yeah, I, I get that they're supposed to be like new boots or the, the boots are supposed to be squeaking, but there's no there's no sense that they are stepping on dirt or snow. Crunchy snow is what yeah. you would expect, yeah. Men die all around him, but he continues nonchalantly to the edge of a trench. Is this trench 17A154? Yes. Lieutenant von Pischkowski reporting for duty, sir. His superior, Captain Herman Kraft, tries to convince him into the trench as shells explode all around him, but he seems disgusted by the dirt. Eventually, he climbs down into the trench. Kraft asks him why he's here, and he says his father was a colonel, and he wanted a military background. I feel like this is one of those movies where I'm taking all these things in, and I'm acknowledging that they're supposed to be funny, but they're in no way right. amusing to me. I'm also, because it's the very beginning of the movie, trying to sort out what kind of a movie this is. Yes. Yeah. And is this just a, you know, ridiculous laugh right. a minute comedy? Is this like a Zucker Abram Zucker thing? Is this just a serious movie with minutely funny moments like this? I feel like it was trying to be like a catch-22 kind of thing, mm-hmm. but failing? Yeah. 
you know, where it's it's supposed to be sort of, you know, it's a Satire. serious, it's yeah, it's a serious subject matter, but yeah, they're being satirical with it, and it just doesn't, it really just doesn't hit home, and yeah. and it's also the way that they do it is really confusing. I don't understand who this character is for most of the movie, yeah, and he's our main character. Yeah, he was. I think David Bowie was for sure miscast. But also probably miswritten. I was gonna say I don't know that it's his fault. He doesn't. He, he, they don't reveal anything about this character over the course of the movie that helps me understand him. Yeah. Just as Paul and Kraft line up their guns to fire on the enemy, people around them appear to be celebrating, tossing their weapons up out of the trench. Captain Kraft says that it's just enthusiasm for battle. It seems obvious that the war is over, but Kraft insists that the war could never be over while they were losing, and orders Paul to attack with him alone. The two men climb up out of the trench and race toward the enemy until an explosion hits them directly. We see a body sprawled out on the ground, and we cut to Paul in the hospital with bandages around his head. Who were the people that were celebrating? Were they on their side, or were they the enemy? They were the people on their side. The war was over, and they were celebrating that the war was over, even though they lost it. seemed like they were attacking their own people, then? I I was so confused. No, they they got up out of the trench and were marching away from their own celebrating people. Okay. But... Someone saw them and thought they were attacking and hit them. They were. <laughs> they were, yeah. <laughs> they correctly assessed the situation. Would you remember the last time people didn't understand that the war was over? <laughs> Catch-22? I was going to go with the big red one, but sure. <laughs> the big red one was more recently because Catch-22 was in the 70s. So you win. As he looks around the crowded room at the hospital, Paul realizes it's a French hospital, and when they notice him looking around the room, they assume that their hero is finally conscious, and a band strikes up to celebrate his survival. He has to break it to one of the nurses that he is not a French soldier, and the national hero that they've come to celebrate is actually from another nation. And there's dozens of people in this room. Right, yeah. a full like, band. Just like, like everybody's like half asleep in this room waiting for him to awaken so that they could celebrate him. And there's a banner on the wall about their new mm-hmm. national hero. Yeah, and see, I hadn't yet put together enough that he is a German soldier. Right, and yeah. And he is, he is the enemy to these people. Especially because so rarely in America are movies told from the German perspective. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, okay, well, David Bowie's not a, a German citizen, right? So I don't understand who this is supposed to be about or what's happening here. But uh, I think another part of the joke was supposed to be that France does is not a nation of national heroes. Like they're they're famous for their surrendering and and everything. So the point was, oh, this person was on a battlefield and was wounded. So this is like the first French person to ever not give oh, up on a is fight. That supposed to be the joke. I don't I don't know why else <laughs> they would have a full band for this one injured soldier. It's like, is there no one else that was injured in the whole war? Apparently, the assumption that he was French is based on the fact that he was discovered holding a french soldier's helmet but they never explain why yeah. that is he didn't get across to the next trench so yeah. mm-hmm. there's no reason he should have that see like and that that's an easy fix like in the scene when he's like in the trench is like oh we don't have any more helmets here's, here's here a, take one here's, a, here's, a, here's one of the french ones yeah just like like make it make it something make, make it logical they're furious with him for misleading them and after they all leave he exits the hospital on his own He asks people for directions to his hometown, and he seems to steal rides on a series of trains to get there. We reach Berlin in the winter of 1921, and a pair of women approach the camera as the picture fades from sepia tone to full color. They complain about all the protesters in their town. Well, (laughs) watching this off of what I'm assuming is a YouTube rip, uh, full color is (laughs) is quite a statement. It's just a slightly more vivid sepia tone. Mm Mm-hmm. A young woman in blue tries to gather everyone's attention on the street corner, but she's not having much luck. Paul walks the streets carrying a live pig. He's drawn in by the song of the protesters, who are building an audience in a circle. The people around him notice that he's carrying a pig, and some are licking their lips at him. He has to run away to keep these people from stealing the pig and presumably eating it, and eventually he's drawn away the protester woman's entire audience. Paul ducks into a building, and we see a sign that says, Pension v. Prigotsky to Etage. So this is a building in his family because it has the same last name as he does. It seems like he's escaped the crowd when suddenly a woman in fancy clothes comes down the stairs of the building with two enormous dogs. The woman looks back at Paul before turning the corner to leave. 
Paul knocks on another door of the building, and a man opens it and lets him in as he leaves, thinking nothing of the man holding a pig. I already got the impression, because of the title, that this was supposed to be a whorehouse, Mm -hmm. and this was a customer leaving, Yeah, but I don't think it actually is. I think it's just like a a hotel. I I think for some people it is. Maybe. I I think that uh, Ava does business there. Yes, that's true. But I think it's just an apartment building that they rent out. I assume his family is the owners? Yeah, the Prigotskys. Yeah, his, his aunt owns the building. As Paul moves around the building, he notices a woman through a doorway and calls out to her for help, but she closes her door in his face. He enters another room, decorated in black and white, where two bald men are sitting across the table from each other holding soft-boiled eggs. No idea why (laughs) these characters don't come back. It just looks like he wandered into a music video for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he walks out of it, and we never see anything like that for the rest of the movie. Paul creeps awkwardly past these men, while he wanders past another door in the hallway, an older woman is suddenly leaning out over the top of the door because this hallway is like extra tall so that she can mm-hmm. lean over a full-size door and tell him that there's no room here, but that they might have room for the pig, which I think means they probably just want to cook it up for people. He calls up to her as Aunt Hilda, and she finally recognizes him as her nephew, Paul. I'm guessing Hilda is the madam here, or maybe she's just the landlord. Apparently, everyone in the family thought he was dead. We thought you were dead. No, I'm not dead. I'm very much alive. But, 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 how long have you been alive? Ever since I can remember. Look, what is going on here? She tells him that his mother will faint when she sees him, and he asks where to find her. She tells him that his mother is working at a Turkish bath. Do you remember the last time we brought up a Turkish bath? Uh, Caligula? That was actually more recent than that. (laughs) And that's probably a Roman bath. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, when they go into the inventing room, Grandpa Joe says that it looks like a Turkish bath. Mm. When I also thought this was a euphemism that she was performing sexual acts. Right, yeah. Because it's like, when does the gigolo stuff start? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's an hour and three minutes in. I timed it. (laughs) (laughs) The movie's only an hour and a half. (laughs) Paul asks his Aunt Hilda to kick whoever's staying in his room out while he goes to find his mother. At the Turkish bath, we hear his mom making up war stories about him, insisting that he rejected an iron cross to help the country. They wanted to award him the iron cross, but I told them not to bother to keep their medals for the war efforts. When Paul enters the baths, his mother says that the war department told her that he died. He tries to cheer her up by announcing that he brought home a pig, as she tells him that when his father finds out that all he brought home was a pig, that he'll have another stroke of paralysis. We cut right to Paul's father frozen in a chair with a book open in front of him. Apparently he froze like this when the war ended. Like this war? Like the war the that, just war ended. that just yeah. ended? So like Paul left and he was his dad was fine and then he as came As soon as he got hit with that bomb on the battlefield, his father froze in place because he was worried for the future of Germany. Uh-huh. And he had a stroke. Okay. Paul tries to assure his father that the war is far from decided. The next morning, Paul is in his bed, and he's having a flashback dream with guns firing because in the present, someone is throwing eggs at his bedroom window. The girl throwing eggs from an upstairs balcony is shouting his name and then rushes into the kitchen to retrieve Paul's breakfast from Aunt Hildy, who introduces the character with some expository dialogue. To what do we owe this unexpected visit of our housekeeper's socialist daughter? You know, for for people who seem to be so starving and to the, to that the sight of a pig is is causing them to salivate, wasting eggs to get somebody's yeah. attention seems like an odd odd thing. Well, I don't know if anyone that lives here is is in that sort of trouble. Uh, but I think they are sort of in worse off position than they were when he left because he was kind of taken aback that his mother was working yeah like that was that was like shocking to him it's kind of like a later season downton abbey situation where they're just (laughs) like oh we made a bunch of terrible decisions and now we all have to work except for maggie smith she's fine just calling us out on our bullshit the socialist daughter of the housekeeper whose name is apparently silly with a c greets Paul with his breakfast, and he asks her what has happened to their home while he was at war. She doesn't really answer his question, but on her way out, asks if he happened to know that she is one of the most popular artists of the working class. Well, I know you sing in the streets. Well, we can't all be war heroes. 
So I was trying to figure out like the timeline of how long he's actually been gone. Because it seemed like he was just showing up to war. Yeah, exactly. It seems like he just got there a little too late because, uh, you know, he still got his brain. Like they make a point about his boots. Yeah, like that, that it's all new. It's all new uniform. Uh, and then I'm assuming he was convalescing in the hospital for, you know, probably a number of months. It could have been years, maybe, if they, I mean, if they want to say it's been a long time. Uh, it's just uh, so like. I guess it would be a shock if this is the state of things in that short amount yeah. of time. But it's we establish that it's 1921 when he arrives home, mm-hmm. right? And isn't when did World War One end? 2021 was it before 2021, that? 2021, right now. 2020. <laughs> I meant 1920 or 1921. I don't know. Or 2021. Who knows? I don't know. The only thing I know about World War One is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. That's it. I'm yeah, out. <laughs> people were really into that song at the time. <laughs> Was I wrong about it? Is that not no, the guy's right. name? Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you're lonely, you know I'm here waiting for you. Right? That's Franz Ferdinand. I never put together that that band was named after. The I'm just across here. Assassinated I'm just Duke. Just sure <laughs> that we can lose. Yeah, so I went back and checked. So 1918. So the war was technically so the, over in... So, so yeah, so the war was over. So in theory, maybe he was missing for two years. Or, yeah, he was in that French hospital yeah. for... Because he does make a comment later that he spent a lot of time in a French hospital. Mm. Right. So maybe he spent, you know, three years there after spending eight minutes on the battlefield. Hildy pops in with a coat and monocle for Paul that once belonged to her husband, Paul's uncle Heinrich. It's a good fit, but Hildy will have to patch the bullet hole through which her husband was presumably shot and killed. See, this movie keeps crossing those lines of, like, satire, comedy. I didn't even know if this was supposed to be a joke or not. Like, I guess, it, looking back, that it was supposed to be funny, I think. But it, in the scene, it just feels like an emotional moment. Like, yeah, you know, we don't have yeah. a lot of coats. This is what you get. And I'm sorry that that reminds you of your dead uncle. I'll patch it so you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Out of nowhere, everyone in the room gets very quiet, all shushing each other, until a man in a three-piece suit with a bowler cap passes by. We don't know. We think it's something to do with tax. How do you feel, Paul? What? What does that mean? I don't know. Is he staying here for free and you're letting him so that he doesn't yeah. tax you for stuff? Why can't you talk around him? Is, is this the guy from Popeye? Who, yeah. Who is this around? the Donald Moffat character? Yeah. <laughs> He's just going to nickel and dime you if you say anything around him? I feel like we're also getting hints as we go through this movie of you know, of, of, of what's about to happen with World War II and, right. you know, Nazism taking hold in this area. But I'm not sure if this is part of that or not. I don't I know. Do, I don't know. <laughs> Back to the Turkish bath, Paul seems to be working as a towel boy. One of his mother's co-workers tells her that the job is beneath him and goes to have a talk with the boy. The man starts to tell Paul about a potential military job, but then Paul cuts him off, thanking the major for the help he's already given their family. We cut to a street corner where six men are all being employed to dress as beer bottles. I think it's beer bottles. Some kind yeah. of bottle. Tough man. And uh, a whole... <laughs> surly. <laughs> Sorry, Surly. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> a whole six pack of men are doing the job, and Paul has some trouble getting the costume on until what looks like a five-year-old kid helps him get dressed. I thought this kid would play a bigger part in the movie overall, but he's only in like I a couple I thought the scenes. beer bottle would play a bigger part mm, in the movie. Yeah, that's true. It really doesn't. <laughs> The bottles march off and Paul hangs back in the rear. Once they've split up to the corners where they'll do business, Paul encounters the Major on the street, who recognizes him instantly. Good morning, Paul. Oh, good morning, Major. How did you know it was me? I'm a Major Lieutenant. You didn't think I could fail to recognize the contents of any bottle at 50 paces, eh? <laughs> again, he warns Paul that this job is degrading and tries to describe the military job again. While they talk, Two fancy women walking the opposite direction down the street somehow steal the focus of the camera and microphone, but their dialogue is mostly unintelligible. These are the time travel women. Yeah. And every time we're going to jump forward a year, we start with these two, just talking to each other about nothing. It, it reminds I kept thinking of the princesses from Bill and Ted 3. Oh, sure, yeah. Like just showing up as these old ladies just keep showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Back at Hildy's that night, she asks about the new job. She also asks him to take some flowers to a guest named Ava and to please put them in a vase in her room. 
The room appears empty except for a Dalmatian that notices Paul enter. He takes a seat at Ava's desk to sniff her perfumes. He notices a framed photo of her and looks at it for a moment until the dogs freak out because they can hear her coming up the stairs. She passes the huge bottle mascot costume, and when she enters the room, she finds Paul on her bed covered in the dogs and asks what he's doing here. The flowers look mangled, and he apologizes. She asks him to please move the big bottle so it's not blocking her door. Outside the room, he accidentally knocks the bottle down the stairs, causing a ruckus, and Eva laughs in her room when she hears it. I actually really wanted this whole thing to shatter, like it was actually made out of glass. Yeah. But that's not what happened. Later, Paul, the young boy that helped him get into the costume, and the bottle are standing in the middle of the street together. In the middle of the night, Silly surprises Paul by jumping into his bed in her underwear. She tries a little role play, suggesting she could be his little soldier's whore, and then admits that she's always fantasized that he would take her away and have sex with her in all manner of exotic locations. On the floor? Or in a boat? Or in the middle of the city? On the Victory Monument? There was no victory. It's like the weirdest fox and socks you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> fox <laughs> and socks. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Sam I am. Sam I am. There you go. The green eggs and ham. <laughs> he doesn't respond much to her efforts, accusing her of faking this whole persona. And when she realizes that he's not even looking at her, but the stars outside, she redresses to leave. She tells him to keep looking at the stars and maybe she'll be one of them someday. Paul stands on his balcony watching Silly retreat to her room, and below, he notices Ava making a date with a paying customer. Afterward, she notices that Paul witnessed the entire interaction, and he steps inside. We cut to Paul working at a typewriter. Through his doorway, he notices Ava accepting a pile of gifts from a delivery man, and she asks for Paul's help. He follows her into her room, carrying some of her boxes, and before he can leave, she offers him a drink. He notices what trouble the dogs are for her, and asks why she doesn't just get rid of them. Gifts from old lovers must always be kept, no matter how cumbersome. Sometimes I think the larger the gift, the more ineffective the lover. She notices Paul watching her strangely, and he admits that he saw her doing business last night. She tells him this wasn't always her plan, and he asks if she's ashamed. I think shame belongs to another decade. There is no such thing. You shouldn't be ashamed of your bottle, either. It's a wonderful hiding place until you find yourself. <laughs> when he laughs at this joke, she compliments his smile. He asks if things will ever be the same, and she doubts it. And now we cut two years forward. He's just, like, started to establish these relationships, and we're just learning about how his house has changed, and now we're he's been here for two years, and none of that matters anymore. Yep. N none of it mattered before. <laughs> That's true. We cut to Paul entering a boxing gym, and he's here to meet with someone and is pointed to the boss man on a catwalk. It turns out the man he's here to see is Captain Kraft, the superior who was hit by the same explosion that hospitalized him at the start of the film. Are you still alive? Of course I am, sir. And ready for duty. The captain walks in circles around Paul, and they discuss their plans to continue the war effort to save Germany's reputation. Kraft leads Paul through the subway and pulls him up into an empty train on the tracks, just as another train is passing on the open rails. The train car is the headquarters of Kraft's whole operation. He puts on a gramophone and claims the music that it's playing is Wagner, but all Paul can hear is the incessant grinding of an empty gramophone. Kraft describes for Paul Hitler's fantasy of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed nation, and from this train car they will spread their intentions throughout the nation. Do you remember the last time we had an inactive train car as a business headquarters? On the right track. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I was going to say Harold and Maud. We was didn't it, cover that movie. Isn't her, but was her house a train? Was it car? a train? And I know she had like, a, it was a very elongated yeah, yeah. structure. From this train car, they will spread their intentions throughout the nation. Kraft invites him to stay here on the train car with him, and he accepts. Moments later, Paul is humming Wagner music to the still grinding gramophone when another man, Otto, enters the car and sees Paul, calling him swine and a traitor. Paul demands to be addressed as Lieutenant Pregotsky, and Otto knocks him to the ground with a punch to the nose. Who's this guy? I don't know. Nope. I, I feel like... 
he never comes back after this scene. Yep. But the way that, like, there's something that he says or the way that he's acting that makes me think that he might be this guy's lover. Like, they're. Oh, like, that he's his former boyfriend and he thinks that now yeah, he's that's, being that's cheated on. Yeah, that's kind of what I. T- that's how possible. I, took it. I didn't read it that way, but that makes more sense than anything else I can fathom. But it never comes back. Right, because Kraft shows up and he asks Paul to step outside while he deals with Otto. Uh, and then while. Paul is standing outside. He just hears Kraft beating the shit out of Otto and yeah. screaming at him, and then ending this whole punishment with uh, talking about how he can't stand violence. We skip ahead another year. What? Why? Why are we doing that? In Hildy's kitchen, she and Paul's mother are arguing over which of them will need to kill the goose for their holiday meal. A ring at the door saves them both. It's Paul and Kraft and Kraft's assistant Lothar. <laughs> just a large man who yeah. came with them where is the rocket <laughs> sorry that's from rocketeer yeah that's lothar is the name of <laughs> the character <laughs> the character yeah. with the long face was it tiny ron yeah who plays him? <laughs> do you remember the last character that we had named lothar for the podcast <sighs> sounds familiar no it was for michael gross's very first film appearance He's in one scene, and his character's named Lothar. It's, uh, just tell me what you want. That's right. Paul's mother makes it sound like Paul has brought his boyfriend to meet his parents, but I hadn't heard any notes of that earlier. And I think that's the case. I think he's bringing his boyfriend to meet his family, and I don't know why they brought Lothar along, if that's (laughs) the case. so he's dating Kraft at this point? I think so. So... Because, Otto, because so Otto had every right to be upset about him bringing him in. I guess, but then why is Otto apologizing to the cheater when the cheater gets home? I don't know. I, I, I don't think that they are dating. I think, at the most, Kraft thinks they are. But but then the mom here says, "I'm so glad you could come. I I have I have the feeling Paul was trying to hide you from us. I'm so glad he feels fine in his new position. I think he's just working for him." But then he says, Paul is one in a million, aren't you? Yes, he is. I don't know. It just, it came across as a relationship to me. I, I, I agree, but I don't, uh, t- from what we, I understand about Paul, that I feel that Paul is very emotionally cut off. And I don't feel that if, he, even if Kraft thinks that this is a relationship, which I can see the arguments absolutely yeah, yeah, before, yeah. I don't think that Paul is thinking anything of it. I, I think he seems very distant when he's with women. Mm. But when he's with Kraft, he doesn't seem that way. He seems like they share a passion. Well, they share the passion for reuniting Germany. And And maybe they're conflating passions. Mm. See, I feel like Paul is just sort of like this hapless guy who just kind of goes along with whatever's happening around him. That's kind of true. I don't feel like this is a relationship. I feel like he's just like, okay, I got a job. Now, you know, do whatever you tell me to do for this job. Kraft offers to kill the goose for them, and Lothar follows him into the kitchen to handle it, despite Kraft being a vegetarian. We see Kraft appear to choke the goose out, and finally its wings stop flapping, and we cut right to dinner, where Paul's father is still frozen in his chair, but now he's decked out in his military uniform. He's kind of reminding me of Jerry Blank's dad from Strangers with Candy, Mm. because you remember every time we see him, he's just frozen in place? Yeah. But he never had any lines for, like, the whole series. (laughs) Kraft raises a glass to thank the colonel for his contribution to the war. Lothar toasts to Ava's contribution, and she says she considered it a donation to Paul's new life. Sorry, what was Ava's donation? I don't know. We don't we don't see that donation happen. Okay. I thought it was This is I should mention there's a longer version of this movie with almost an hour of additional footage. Another hour? I think. Well, I, I saw that there was weird editing notes in the credits. Yeah, it's it's 40 minutes to an hour longer, the full version. But that only ever played once overseas, and it got such a terrible reception that they cut it down to an hour 40 for the British release and then left it short for the U.S. release. Huh. So this is the only version of this film that survives because it did so poorly in its initial run. Did this version do any better? No, it didn't. It got it j- mm-hmm. got the same crappy reviews every okay. time they put it out. Because I mean, this is rough. It's it's rough to follow, and it's and it and it really has no story. I feel like sense. honestly, I feel like I would be less annoyed by a longer version where I at least understand all the references the characters are making, sure. even if it's bad. 
I want to know what these things mean and who these people are to each other. But I don't because important things didn't make it out <laughs> of the this, movie. Like, is this why we do a year later like constantly? Because there's a whole bunch more stuff that happened that would have. I shown think the so, but and time. like the first one though, like Richard <laughs> said, it's two years they skip forward. Yeah. It's like why did we skip two years for just this one section? It's very weird. While they eat, people around the table poke fun at Kraft for not eating meat. They ask if it's for religious reasons, and Kraft admits that he's an atheist. They tell me you don't eat meat. Not a bite. Oh. Mm, that reminds me of an old comrade of mine from Minsk. He had the same. Silly continues mocking Kraft until he tells Paul that they must ignore what women have to say, and Ava asks Kraft what he knows of women at all, and so Kraft stands to leave, embarrassed. I think this is another reason why I thought that you know he was he was gay and these were relationships that yeah like with Otto. Hildy tries to stop him on his way out, insisting that he's always welcome here, and Paul leaves to follow Kraft as Silly tries to follow him. She asks him where he lives now and what he's up to, and he refuses to answer. Kraft smokes around a corner and listens to this whole exchange. At the end of their conversation, Silly gives him a big kiss, and when Silly returns to Hildy's, Paul steps up to Kraft, who slaps him across the face before hugging him and begging him to stay. But he doesn't stay. He turns and he walks away from him. And then we cut forward again another year to the winter of 1925. So I don't know what just happened there. Did they break up? Because they seemed like they were reuniting when he hugged him and then he let go and he walked away. So now it's 1925. Paul finds his mother at the Turkish bath and she asks where he's been for so long. Where have you been so long? I'm not sure. Thanks, movie. (laughs) <laughs> skip a year and even the characters don't know what happened in the missing time i'm glad we included this back and forth he asks where silly can be found these days and his mother points him to a nearby club as paul enters the place silly is mid-rehearsal of a dance number on stage we'll become homemates only married to one hot girl like me likes it better to be she's very happy to see him when the song ends and she drags him out on a walk. She asks him how he's dealing with his shell shock, which has become her shorthand for his disinterest in having sex with her. We cut to a band performing at the club, and Silly Taboo is introduced to the stage. Sydney Rome is actually singing the song here, Don't Let Him Be Too Long, and I actually really love her voice. Like, Mm -hmm. the music is the strongest part of this movie, because I actually like the songs. Yeah, this this song's great, though her outfit is very weird for I the actual performance. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. We're not at the performance yet, but the outfit for the final. Performance. No, this is the actual performance. Oh, okay. Now. I don't understand it at yeah. all because, like, it's it's skimpy. Like we're seeing we're seeing her boobs and like you know like so it seems almost a burlesque act. But the top uh, of her head looks but, like a sharpened pencil. Yeah, she's got this weird fez shaped like pointy black hat on that wraps around her chin with like bling on it. I don't. I don't understand what this is. Yeah. After the show, we see a few talent scouts in the audience who tell the club owner, Max, that they're interested in signing Silly as a client. They compare her to Al Jolson in terms of appeal, and one of Jolson's bigger hits, Swanee, was written by the same person who translated the song referenced in this film's title. Do you recall our most recent Al Jolson reference on the podcast? Um, that Neil Diamond film? More recently than that, In the fun house, when they're about to see the strip show, he says, like the great Al Jolson said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Or you ain't heard nothing yet, I guess. Did we reference Al Jolson in the jazz singer? Yeah, because he's the original jazz singer was, he was the star of it. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying, I I was right. (laughs) Yes. No, Al Jolson, yeah, (laughs) was was the basis of that film. But fun house was more recently. And then uh, in between those two, we did a mini-sode on Leo and Lori, where a couple characters sing a al jolson song i don't listen to our mini everybody listens to the mini sods <laughs> paul and silly hop in a taxi together well did you like it it wasn't quite what i expected i i wasn't really trained for that kind of thing what are you talking about do you think people are trained to enjoy musical performances If anyone is, you were because you sat through the rehearsal of the same show. How was it not what you expected? She's obviously disappointed with this review. They pull up to Silly's enormous mansion. 
It's got everything. It's got 70 rooms. Dogs, cats, horses, silverware, servants, and a prince. A what? It turns out she's living here with a man who has promised her the mansion when he dies. Yeah, it's not hers. Right. It's just where she's living. But it's hers eventually. Silly lays out blankets and pillows for them to make love in front of the fireplace, but Paul looks for a reason not to and settles on the fact that this is someone else's home. Like he only ever has sex in homes that he owns. Silly is very insistent, but Paul puts up a long fight. Instead of just telling her he isn't interested, he switches from lame excuse to lame excuse. Germany today is no place to raise a family. Well, who's talking about a family? I just want to make love. Why do you have to complicate things? He switches tactics from, I don't want kids, to, Why doesn't anyone want kids? Why is it the only thing that women think about is sex? I mean, what happened to... What happened to families and children and parents? Oh, they died. It was in all the papers last week. Didn't you read it? Eventually, she gives up pushing him because he's too big of a chicken shit to just say no thanks. It seemed like earlier he was very open about his sexuality with his family, so I don't know why he's dragging his feet telling random women that they have no leverage over him. Later, we see Paul in a bathtub, and the prince enters, played by Kurd Jurgens. Paul starts asking him about his entire family tree for some reason, and the prince mentions a few murderers in the family who caught their brothers cheating with mistresses. Paul finally goes silent. Max, the club owner, finds Silly at the mansion, to tell her in person about the offer the men at the club made. They want to see you right away, but I mean, no! But I can't. But they are thinking of taking you to Hollywood. Hollywood? Paul asks the prince for one of the towels, and the prince hands it to him on the end of his cane. You're going to kill me, aren't you? We cut to Silly in a car full of American agents laughing heartily. Paul eventually returns to Silly's club to ask where she is, and is told that she's gone. I really can't understand why she'd leave without telling anybody. She didn't give a shit about you. Why does he care? Every time he finds her, he spends all of their time together trying to escape her, and it doesn't seem like she's avoiding him, because every time she finds him, she leads him to a bed. And this, and then this was the reason why I thought maybe he isn't gay. I don't understand this character. Like, we I don't really either. just, like, I don't know his motivations ever. When Paul is left alone at a table, a nearby customer introduces himself as a classmate from their military academy. He says that he's stationed at Baroness von Semmering's bar at Hotel Eden. He points to his date and her friend and asks if Paul might help entertain the ladies since he doesn't have it in him to satisfy both of them. They head to Hotel Eden together, and the other man immediately walks away from his date to speak with some men at the bar. He returns to the dance floor to inform Paul that the Baroness would like to see him. Now, for the whole next scene, Marlena Dietrich, as the Baroness, is sitting at a table in Paris, pretending to address David Bowie, who is in Berlin, pretending to see her. She offers him a drink from hundreds of miles away. It's convincing, though. I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that they yeah. were in different they, places. There's no, obviously, there's no wide shots or over the shoulders with doubles, Yeah. Um, which I think would sell it even more. But the way it works out, I didn't know until I read that trivia point afterward. Yeah. Champagne? Don Perignon? My favorite. Dancing, music, champagne. The best way to forget until you find something you want to remember. She quizzes him on his language skills. She finds him quite charming and expects he'd make a fine addition to her stable of man horse because she is the madam of this Mm -hmm. film. Right, and now is when we are... He's a gigolo, finally. An hour and three minutes in. She sends him a box full of cash from across the room and instructs Paul to satisfy his date to earn his pay. He asks her to dance. We cut back to Hildy's place where Helga enters. This is a new character played by Kim Novak and is not the Ava character who we will never see again in the film. Correct. She announces the death of her new husband, the general. And all his life, he wanted to die with a bullet. But then... We can't always have what we want, can we? Everyone offers their condolences. Paul interrupts a moment of silence by tripping over some things in the entry hall, and we cut to the funeral. Because the pallbearers are all in Prussian army uniforms, the mourners are actually being fired on by enemy insurgents. This doesn't make any sense. This, again, is like a weird... I don't know. It it reminds me of like a Catch-22 kind of moment. Right. It's like... Well, this isn't 
this isn't realistic. Like, why mm-hmm. is this happening? Well, th- there were different factions that were fighting over control of Prussia to gear up to relaunch uh, the Second World War. And so people were fighting over, like, who's going to lead this army next time? And so they're fighting it out here at the funeral, shooting at, at the mourners. Right. But this whole scene seems very slapsticky. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and satirical. Like, I don't want to. It reminds me of the movie Top Secret. Like, yeah. It feels like yeah. that. Like, you know, there's this, all these gags about, like, people hiding behind identical, identical, four identical men hiding behind four identical gravestones. Yeah. And then all peeking around at the same time. And uh, they, they leave Paul's father just in a bunch of bushes mm-hmm. in his wheelchair because they can't hide with him. Paul's father even there. I don't know. I just don't, just out of respect. I yeah. guess. I don't know who this guy is to anyone, but he didn't die of a bullet. He died of, like, a stroke. Right. So... But when they're racing this coffin around the funeral, they end up tossing it into a mausoleum, and Helga is a little pleased to see that there's a bullet hole in the coffin, so he eventually did right. get shot. he got what he wanted. Did you see that? Yes, he finally got his bullet. When more gunfire erupts outside, Helga and Paul get low to the ground, and suddenly they're making love. Helga is giving Paul military commands. Charge! Later, we see them walking back to Helga's home that she inherited from the general. She dresses Paul up in a nice white suit and teaches him how to walk properly. She puts on a record and asks him to dance. He ignores the request, and she makes it a command. She loses her temper when he again refuses, and he leaves her home. Then we cut a year forward again. 1926, winter again, of course. It's always winter. Perpetual winter. Captain Kraft arrives at Helga's estate looking for Paul, and she informs him that he is too late, that Paul has moved on. Like a year ago? He left a year ago today. Like (laughs) Like this minute, even. I don't know. Like, I'm confused about this moment, too. I'm like, why were you even led here? Yeah. Was he here the whole year, and they just had like a a bad relationship for a while, or when, when did he leave? I don't know. Kraft is directed to Hotel Eden, where Paul is still working for the Baroness. Kraft sends his assistant, Lothar to collect Paul and bring him to the bathroom for a private conversation. They're disappointed to see him ditch the cause of the fatherland in the interest of sexing old ladies for money. Another year goes by for no reason. We hear more of Kraft's Nazi agenda being spoken to other members of his secret group. Outside the Hotel Eden is a big column plastered with advertisements, but there are eye holes cut out all over the thing, and we see that Kraft and his men are spying on the hotel through these holes in the column and then they descend into their underground bunker. Kraft does a bit of call and response with his men to get them amped up. From our lookout posts all over the city, we can watch the degeneration of our society. But are we just going to stand by and watch? No! 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 Are we going to allow our country, our heritage, our women... To be, to be used as a, a breeding ground for genetic mediocrity? Are we going to allow them to do that? No! 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 We must put a stop to it before our own physical fitness and our mental lucidity is jeopardized. We will not let them get away with it, will we? No! 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 And are we going to show them our superiority, our strength and our unity? No! Yes! 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 The men get too excited and start firing their weapons, and one even causes a small explosion. Kraft laments the stupidity of his men, and we see smoke billowing from the pillar that serves as their lookout location in front of the hotel. Winter 28. We see a huge dance number on massive glowing steps with a hundred dancers in top and tails. This looks like it was an expensive shot. Doesn't serve any purpose, though. We back up one level to see that it's actually just Paul in a movie theater, watching that on the screen. Outside the theater... Groups of Nazis march through the streets of the city. Later, at Hotel Eden, Helga spots Paul in the dining hall, where he tries to avoid her, but knows that he's caught. They dance together and compliment each other's improvement. By the way, I have a new husband now. Any general we know. His name is Antonio Jose Felipe de Robateo. As they're separating to finish the dance, Helga admits that she bought Paul out for the night, and tells him which room he can find her in. I may be a gigolo, Frau von Kaiserling, but I'm not a whore. Let's not split hair, shall we? I was confused by this line. 
Yeah, me too, because those are <laughs> synonymous with each other. Okay, that that's what I thought, but I was like, oh, well, maybe not. Maybe it's just he's supposed to be like an escort in the like the truest sense of the of the term. Like he's supposed yeah. to just spend time with old women that pay him, you know, and Yeah, he, well, I mean, I think gigolo is is inherently a sexual position as compared to an escort, which might not necessarily include sexual favors. I think I think they are synonyms. Hmm. So I think all he's saying is, I'm not so cheap that I would just have sex with whoever pays me. Like, I do it for customers. I don't do it for people I know. But she's a customer now. Right. I don't get it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. She elaborates further that she intends to use this encounter here to conceive a child because her wealthy husband is incapable. So I convinced him that no substitute would be quite so appropriate as an officer of Prussian descent. We cut to them in bed while Antonio watches through a doorway from the next room, politely waving. Paul is sufficiently weirded out and waves goodbye to the man while walking out on his job. In the lobby, a man at the piano is playing just a gigolo and Marlena Dietrich, as the Baroness, comes out to sing along with the piano. Just a gigolo when paul gets home he finds his father waiting up to see him he tells his father that he was spoiled with tragedy you know it's easy for you to talk i mean you had it made everything you could ever have hoped for war famine pestilence you had it all. I mean, it really wasn't difficult to be somebody under those conditions. I mean, his father's still, like, in a Frozen. comatose yeah. state. Yeah. Like, he's, he's not saying anything or reacting at all. Right. Paul tells his father that his career may be unorthodox, but he'll make him proud. Paul's mother sneaks up behind him and lovingly suggests that he leave Europe and marry some rich American to provide for him instead. Paul tells her that he's going to bed, and she informs him that Silly plans to marry her prince. When? Saturday. I see. At the wedding, the prince recognizes Paul right away and invites his new bride and her friend to enjoy themselves, essentially giving permission, I thought, for what he probably assumes is a final fling between them before she retires to married life. When he first sees her at the wedding, he says that he's seen her film two and a half times, so that must have been her in that big dance number that he was watching in the theater earlier. Oh. Okay. Okay. I knew you'd come. Did you? Yeah. Come, it's like you always visit the stars every couple of years. She drags Paul through the party, toasting people all the way. Together, they encounter Captain Kraft, who explains that their ideology is coming acceptable to the highest levels of society, and that's why they were invited to the prince's wedding. What does that mean? It just means that Nazism is on the rise in the country. Oh, okay. But they weren't actually invited. I think they were invited. They were? Yeah. Oh. I think that he's saying, look at, he, look at the high levels of the country that we've infiltrated. I thought he was lying, though, and that they were crashing the party and that was just his excuse. That's possible. I mean, we're not given any indication either way. We don't see an invitation and we don't see anyone say, you're not supposed to be here. Well, I feel like when his men flood in, they get a look from, I don't remember, the prince or somebody that's like, think, why are these guys here? I think they get that look because of how weird they're being. The prince drags Kraft away to introduce him to other guests while Silly tells Paul that she can afford him for a couple of hours and intends to buy him for herself as a wedding gift. Well, the prince references that 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 special someone from Munich is here, and I'm, I don't know if that's supposed to be a Hitler reference. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Hitler's not from Munich. Right. But like like but why call attention to the you know there's a particular person? I don't know. They that, did something like that earlier too where a guy said, "Oh, I knew a vegetarian uh, and he was from somewhere else what did the guy say that reminds me of an old comrade of mine from minsk he had the same problem. so were they referencing hitler because he was vegetarian because hitler was a vegetarian i'm assuming that that's why this guy's a vegetarian is because he's just taking after oh, hitler Oh, that makes more sense unless he is supposed to be hitler and they just changed his name for the movie i don't know we see the prince looking impatient while Paul and Silly have disappeared to a bedroom of the mansion. A large crowd of men in brown leather jackets convene in the middle of the party to discuss an incoming group of reds, they say. Outside the party, Silly informs Paul 
that she's leaving for Hollywood soon. She asks him to stay the night with her, and he basically reminds her that he doesn't care about her at all by suggesting that instead she should go off to Hollywood, and if she ever feels like coming back, she can find him at his job and pay him like all his other customers do. But isn't she paying for him now? Yeah, but she's telling him, oh, you should stay the whole night instead of just the two hours I paid for She's clearly very wealthy. Why does she only pay for two hours? I don't understand this. Well, I don't think she, like, has access to the prince's money. I think she's literally just paying a jewelry that she has on her, and she ran out of jewelry. I feel like if they'd cast Brent Spiner to play David Bowie's role, I would just assume this was a holodeck episode, because Paul is completely emotionless throughout the entire story so far. Stuff just happens around him, and he doesn't even react to it. Yeah. He just endures it for a while and then walks away, and he does the same here. And then a year passes. (laughs) Walking down the street, away from the wedding, Paul hears shots being fired from all around him, and eventually, he is shot and killed instantly. And it's played as like a shocking moment, but I don't care. Yeah. Because he was a cardboard cutout of a character, and he's the main character. I was so unbelievably just disinterested and bored. All my notes here are like, will this movie ever end? Yeah. Uh, And because it's not that long of a movie... But it, because it takes place over so many years, it feels long. <laughs> and it seems like a lot of thought went into this movie and nothing comes out of it. Yeah, it makes no sense. Nothing makes any sense. Like every scene is so extravagant. We have parties with hundreds of people and I have no idea what was trying to be communicated by any of it. Yeah. None of the characters feel like real people. Least of all the main character. And I have no idea how he feels about anyone. But he's dead now. Yeah. And while he's lying on the ground, Captain Kraft identifies the body and orders that he be taken to party headquarters and buried with full military honors. I don't see any reds here, so it's possible that they imagined the danger and then thought Paul was the enemy before accepting him as one of their own and pinning the blame on the enemy, like they're using him as a scapegoat. No, I, 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 I thought that I thought it was friendly fire. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, I thought it was friendly fire, but I oh, thought okay. they were saying we're going to blame the Reds for this, and this is going to be the start right. of our revolution. They, they wanted him to be a military hero for them to exploit. Right. Don't make him one of the party, whether he likes it or not. That's what we need: an elegant death. He's not one of ours. Don't worry. I'll make him a hero. Paul's mother is invited to see her son while he's lying in wait. She's confused by the uniform, but Kraft confirms it. These things are not his clothes. He would never have worn such colors. Are you absolutely sure he was one of you? One of the best. One in a million. As Paul's mother rolls his father out of the room, he takes a moment to lean around the chair for one last glance at his son. This is the first time he's moving on his own. Silly enters in her wedding dress and just stares at him for a moment, and then we cut to the time travel twins wandering out into the snow, and that's the end of our film. Because pa- Paul is in full, like, Nazi uniform at yeah. this right. point. Yeah. yeah. But I honestly, like, I guess he's not a Nazi? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, he seems to really like Germany. It's not like he was adamantly against their cause. He he's just super, kind of fell yeah, off the wagon. Yeah, friendly with Kraft. Like, yeah. I... Like, I feel like what I'm supposed to be feeling here is upset that they're using him, but I don't know that they are because I know Mm -hmm. nothing about this guy. Yeah. He didn't resist. Like, I I feel his lifestyle was counter. During, during like, the 20s, like, the the late teens, early 20s of, like, Germany, it was very, there was a lot of, like, free-spirited kind of stuff going on. Uh, There's a Netflix series called... uh, it's either Babylon Berlin or Berlin Babylon. Um, And it's all about like Germany at the brink of world war two when they were cranking down on like homosexuals and, and people who were like have sexual misconduct, misconduct kind of stuff. And I feel like that's all kind of being represented in this film. Like, you know, there, there are people who are, you know, open, openly gay. Maybe Uh, there are definitely people who are performing sexual acts for money yeah and this is not going to have a place in the new regime uh and i feel that he would have paul would have been killed either way because of what he does right uh and so i was trying to find this video clip i'll I'll, I'll never find it because i can't remember the name of the film but um i got that biggest sense of when he's watching that film of this big broadway production yeah uh where you know it's uh this big fanciful thing and like cabaret cabaret is the word I'm looking for. 
uh, cabaret style stuff. And, and how that was like being, all that was trying to be weeded out. Like the stuff at the dinner table when like he says, well, we shouldn't listen to what women have to say. And, but, but it was very free and open right. for women to, to, to speak out. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I feel like this movie's trying to put a lot of stuff out there kind of like leading into what would eventually become world war two Germany. Yeah. But it does it very, very poorly with, with a blank slate of a character who just kind of muddles his way through it. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling. Cause I just don't care about this film at all. Yeah. And I'm trying to give it some kind of weight. So I don't feel like I wasted my time watching. It. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think you have to ascribe any thought to the film uh, that it didn't ascribe to itself. Um, but like we said, Hitler was not from Munich, but he did apparently have an apartment in Munich, which is considered the birthplace and capital of the Nazi party formed in 1920. So when the guy says, I want you to talk to this guy from Munich, he's probably talking about Hitler. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah I, I really didn't like the movie. It wasn't good. It was just, which is a shame because I love David Bowie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he hated this movie. Well, good. He and I are on the same page. <laughs> but it's definitely a thumbs down for me. It's a thumbs down. I would yeah. never recommend anybody watch this. It makes no sense. I don't understand any of the characters. I don't understand the plot. They don't say anything. I don't I don't even think they say Nazis are bad, really. Like, they don't do a good job of saying anything. I mean, the closest the they do to saying Nazis are bad is that when you hear uh, Kraft's rhetoric, it's just like, well, those are disgusting, terrible ideas that you have. But yeah, no but one's nobody, calling him out. Yeah, well, that, but but that's yeah. what I'm saying is, I listen to those things and I think those are horrible, terrible things. But nobody in this movie takes a stand on anything. Which is why we're not sure that Paul wasn't a, a Nazi the whole time because when he's on the train car and he's like, "Yeah, we're gonna kill everybody except for the blonde haired blue eyed people," and Paul's just like, mm, okay. "Oh, okay. Anyway, I like this song that you put on." Yeah. That no one can actually hear, but I'm gonna pretend I can hear you it know, with and, you. And maybe they're making a statement about how people just weren't you know weren't weren't pushing against these I- ideologies as the, as they came around but they they don't make any of this stuff clear as to what they're trying to say about anything yeah where's this going letterboxd wise um i have it in 50th nice, okay nice even five zero out of 54 yeah uh puts it below firecracker and above maniac okay i have it at 45 out of 54 i have it just below earthbound and above harry's war because although it's just as nonsensical as harry's war it's aesthetically pleasing okay like i I think it was an interest interesting to look at that makes me angrier at it oh that it's competently made uh <laughs> in terms of cinematography and set design but that there's there's not a story to it um i have it in 54th out of 54. Nice. You has, would rather watch a Jerry Lewis movie than this? I would because I understood the point of every scene of the Jerry Lewis movie. I just didn't think it was funny. But here yeah. I don't understand half of what's going on. And I don't know. Well, I think that in life I'm just more, I generally don't know what's going on. And I'm just more like, oh, this is pretty. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> what kills a movie for me is a bad protagonist. Yeah. My bottom three movies are hardly working all night long and just a gigolo. And I don't mean evil protagonist. I'm fine with an evil protagonist, but a bad protagonist is one where I don't know what they want. I don't know if they're getting it. I don't know what they think about anybody. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. the case for these three movies. Yeah. Especially for this one. Yeah. And for just a gigolo is the worst offender on that level because I don't know if he's completely asexual and he's a gigolo. I don't know if he's gay. I don't know if he's straight. And he just hates all the women who fall in love with him over the course of this movie. All of his different women pursuers are completely interchangeable. Yeah. They all really want to be with him. He doesn't necessarily hate being with them or like being with them. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> 54 out of 54. That might stay there. That might stick. I can see that sticking. Ooh, ouch. So. That's rough. Our director here was David Hemmings. He wrote and directed on the first of The Running Scareds in 1972. Uh, He also shows up as an actor in Antonioni's Blow Up. 
He's in Camelot, Barbarella, Juggernaut. Uh, in this film, he portrays Captain Kraft. He's Proctor in Equilibrium, Mr. Shermerhorn in Gangs of New York, and Nigel in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He also wrote the lyrics to Don't Let It Be Too Long, which was the song that uh, Silly sang at the club when she was performing. One of the credited writers here is Julius Brammer, who was the original writer of the Just a Gigolo Austrian lyrics. As a result of the song's wide use, Brammer has credits everywhere the song is used, including Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, because it's playing in the Zeppelin scene. The Simpsons, Family Guy, SpongeBob SquarePants, the movie, have all used the, the songs that he I'm wrote. I'm sorry, Just a Gigolo was in SpongeBob? Yeah. Uh, just a gigolo <laughs> slash I ain't got nobody. Oh, probably the probably second Probably the half. latter half of that. <laughs> yeah, I, but there is that episode where SpongeBob is just scrubbing people. Whoa. He's giving them sponge baths. <laughs> Another writing credit for Irving Caesar, because he translated the song into English. I feel like you're giving writing credits away like they're candy here. This mm -hmm. doesn't make much sense. But he has all the same credits. But on top of those, he also wrote T for two and two for tea and he also wrote animal crackers in my soup and he wrote swanee like i said the the jolson hit mm -hmm. and a handful of other long-running classics so his imdb page is just overloaded with every time any of those songs is used why would you put animal crackers in your soup they're like a sweet ask thing. shirley temple yeah. <laughs> didn't she sing that song she I does no yeah I, and i only know because late night tv in like the 90s uh was inundated with like those the Shirley Temple collection. I think that's really... well, that's the voice that plays in my head is from that montage. From yeah, those commercials. And, yeah, it's like fifty VHSs. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what it was. You didn't need that shelf. Watch <laughs> Shirley Temple sing old songs that your grandparents remember. Another writer credit for Ennio De Concini. Lots of Italian credits I didn't recognize, although he did write on Salon Kitty, which we discussed earlier as Tinto Brass's last film prior to Caligula, from which some of the parts were cast. Uh, the last writing credit here is for Joshua Sinclair, who wrote the popular 1986 miniseries on Shaka Zulu. He also wrote a 1977 film called Some Like It Cool, which I'm sure they wanted people to assume was a sequel to Some Like It Hot, since it also starred Tony Curtis but the two films are unrelated. <laughs> Music credit for Gunther Fischer. Uh, only other credit I recognized was for 1980s TV movie Night Kill, which we struck from the schedule last year when we realized it never made it to theaters. Cinematographer Charlie Steinberger. Only other title I recognized was The Death Ray of Dr. Mabuza. Thanks to Stephen for the correct pronunciation of Dr. Mabuza, which I think I previously called Mabuse. I'm sorry, you recognize this title? <laughs> Yeah. Have you seen this movie? No, but it's it come up on the show before. Is that a Fritz Lang movie? Because Fritz Lang did a movie called The Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabuse. Or M A M A B U S E. How 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 does your Mabuse? Mabuse, yeah, that's the same okay. thing. So that's why I was wondering if it was related to Fritz Lang's movie. It must be. It must be a sequel or a remake of some sort. David Bowie played Paul Ambrosius von Prigotsky. He contributed a song called Revolutionary Song to this film, which was I think- Was it in the film? I think it's the song that she's singing in the street when he first finds her. Oh, okay. Because I was trying to keep an ear out for a song that I felt sounded Bowie-like, and I'm like, all of these are- It's barely a song. We hear like a quarter of it, and it's just kind of like, la, 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 as he's walking down the street. Oh, so okay. Um, I don't think we hear much of it. But it was released as a single in Japan and became something of a collector's item because it's hard to find. Obviously, most of his credits are soundtrack credits. Before this, he had appeared in Nicholas Rogue's The Man Who Fell to Earth. Later, he shows up in The Hunger, Yellowbeard, Labyrinth. I know, you're excited for Yellowbeard. <laughs> I, was, I was like, is one scene in Yellowbeard where he walks in the door <laughs> and says a line. Uh, he's also a Pontius Pilate in The Last Temptation of Christ, and he appears as Tesla in Christopher Nolan's best film, The Prestige. Mm -hmm. Sydney Rome plays Silly. She sang the track Don't Let It Be Too Long in the film. Uh, she appears as Nancy, the female lead of Roman Polanski's What? Question mark in 1972. The rest are mostly Italian titles that I was not familiar with. But she was born in like Akron, Ohio, but all of her films were made in Italy. Kim Novak was Helga von Kaiserling. She previously appeared alongside David Hemmings in J. Lee Thompson's Eye of the Devil, but her scenes had to be reshot after she fell off a horse and fractured a vertebra. 
Ugh. Ugh. That happened to Richard earlier today. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, ah. Uh. Fucking horses. She played. <laughs> Wait, fucking horses. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's extracurriculars are getting out of control. <laughs> it's like if I deny it, does that make it worse or better? Well, I'm denying it. <laughs> yeah, if you admit to it, that's worse. <laughs> she plays Madeline Elster and Judy Barton in Vertigo. We had her last year in The Mirror Cracked as Lola Brewster, and later she'll show up in 19 episodes of Falcon Crest. I just realized watching this how much she reminds me of Jane Krakowski, but I might have also said that in our Mirror Cracked review. <laughs> but it's still true. Wouldn't Jane Krakowski remind you of her? No. She reminds me of Jane Krakowski. Because I've never seen Jane Krakowski and been like, you know who she looks like? I'm just saying. Kim Novak. She, Jane Krakowski came second, though. Not for my eyes. Maria Schell played Paul's Muti, Frau von Prigotsky. That's his mother. She played von A ah in Superman. She was the leading scientist who told Jor-El that he was crazy and that Krypton was doing fine and climate change is a myth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I read a post about that recently. It was, it was like, I could never understand why everyone was upset at Jarrell for calling about climate change. It was like, oh, no. Yeah, that's happening now. That makes sense. <laughs> Kurt Jurgens played the prince. He was von Stolberg in The Enemy Below and Stromberg in The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, uh, I love Stromberg in The Spy Who Loved Me. Is, is, while I really like The Spy Who Loved Me as a film, he is a very weak Bond villain. Is he the one who's collecting submarines? Yeah, he's collecting submarines because he's gonna he's, he's he's starting he's, a world war. Yeah, yeah, he's doing the opposite of what Drax is gonna do. Yeah, like he's just trying to create a utopian society where he's in charge. Right. Um, but <laughs> I do love his death, and I, I'm sorry I'm gonna take a tangent on this because it's like my <laughs> my favorite death because they're sitting at a long table and like apparently there's a spear gun that goes the length of the table and he tries to spear James Bond with it. Yeah, and he misses. So then James Bond puts his gun down the tube of the spear gun barrel, which, again, goes the entire length of the table and shoots it, which somehow goes through and goes through the mechanisms of the spear gun and it hits Strongberg. Yeah. And then Bond gets up and just starts walking toward him, unloading his gun. More and more and more. And I'm like, oh, my God. One shot was enough. And then later on when... When he when he goes to tell Barbara Bach, she's like, "What happened to Stromberg?" And you think he's gonna have this quick, quick quippy line, you know, like and he goes, "He's dead." <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, Jesus!" <laughs> this movie got so dark towards the end. That's awesome. Marlena Dietrich played Baroness von Semmering. This was her final feature film appearance, as she was reportedly paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for two days on set. Worth every penny. She performed the song Just a Gigolo herself at the film's close. She was nominated for Best Actress for Morocco in 1930. She was Tanya in Touch of Evil, Mrs. Berthold in Judgment at Nuremberg, and Lola Lola in The Blue Angel. Rudolf Schundler played Oberst Gustav von Prydotsky. That's the father, I think. He was Professor Milius in Suspiria. He's Carl in The Exorcist. And he's Hardy in The Testament of Dr. Mabuza. Gunter Meisner played Betrunkener Arbiter, uncredited. He played Farnbach in The Boys from Brazil, and we just had him in our Patreon review of Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, where he played Slugworth. And I talked about how great a name Gunter Meisner is. I'm sorry, what role did he play? He was uh, Betrunkener Arbiter. What is a Betrunkener? Uh, is a German word, <laughs> which means someone who puts things in trunks. I don't know. Do you guys recall the last time we saw somebody put something in a trunk? <laughs> <laughs> the hand? No. More recently. I'll give I'll tell you what they put in the trunk, maybe that'll help. Okay. A wet child. What? <laughs> a wet child in a trunk? <laughs> thought that would give it away. <laughs> no, I got nothing. <laughs> Bloody birthday. Oh, Remember, she child? dumps a fishbowl over the kid and then puts him in a trunk and closes it. Oh, oh I was thinking of a car I, truck. Yeah, same here. I was like, <laughs> I was stuck on car trunk. Yeah, like, me too. What? No, a betrunkener can use any kind of trunk. 
They call it a boot. I think that's everything for Just a Gigolo. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing King of the Mountain, which IMDb describes like so. A group of friends race their high-powered cars up and down a dangerous and deadly mountain road known as Mulholland Drive <laughs> to see what they can... Sorry. I'm, I know. I'm, I'm laughing because I take Mulholland Drive like yeah. every day. Known as Mulholland like, Drive makes it sound oh, legendary. It's like, it's oh God. <laughs> <laughs> to see who can claim the title of the King of the Hill. But the movie's called King of the Mountain. Nobody calls it King of the Hill. We leave you now with a trailer for King of the Mountain. In a city of light, sound. Dangerous, dangerous, slide into the night. And speed. One man who puts it all together will become king of the mountain. The proving ground? 23 miles of mountain road, slicing the city in two. Even by day, it's dangerous. By night, it's deadly. He's given his life to this road, his days to figuring the line, his nights to fighting the challengers. Not a chance, pal. Not a chance. And now that he's finally got them beat, he's a living legend. I know who you are. The fast one. I can drive that course blind. I own it. It's mine. But to stay a legend, he'll have to remain unbeaten. You know that thing that jerks your head back, you know? Locks your jaw and clenches your teeth. Fear. I thought you were just shy. I'm not exactly shy. I'm careful. I want to challenge tonight! You don't need that brace. He does. You gonna be here tonight when I get back? You mean, if you get back. You got it! Go for it! Come in! Time is speed! Speed is time! When you're the best, someone always wants you to prove it. Harry Hamlin is King of the Mountains.